Thank you everyone for coming out uh, today for the final talk in the Rotten Speaker Series for this year. It's a pleasure to introduce Charlotte Brunkel, who uh, works in philosophy of physics as well as philosophical issues in climate change, which is what we're going to hear about today. She defended her PhD working with Jeremy Butterfield at the University of Cambridge, uh, and then after she went to Oxford, she's been at the LSA, LSE for a number of years, and she's about to move to a position in Salzburg. But uh, today she's going to be speaking on confirmation and calibration of climate science, so please join me in welcoming her to us. Yeah, thanks so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Mm -hmm. and so as Chris said, I'm talking about uh, some topic in the philosophy of climate science, um, namely about the topic of confirmation and calibration. So what I will do is, at the very beginning, just to introduce the problem. It's a very simple and basic problem. So I'll use an example from climate science to introduce the problem, namely um, aerosols. So aerosols are just small particles in the atmosphere. And um, the aerosols are important um, in climate science because effectively what they are doing is they reflect the sunlight. And so I mean, it's a simple story. They lead overall to the cooling um, of, the, of the Earth. And this aerosol forcing in climate models now measures the change in the mean temperature resulting from the concentration of aerosols. So it measures the extent of the cooling, this is what you could say. And important now, I mean, in climate science, um, that's of course a problem that in general, we, there's very relatively little understanding of the physical process. Because of course the Earth is an extremely complex system, there are all kinds of processes happening constantly. And so there's not enough understanding to know what the aerosol forcing is. You can't physically just calculate it. And so what you do is to just use data to estimate um, the aerosol forcing. Just the normal case of a, you have a parameter, a free parameter, and you estimate it with the data. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I would call calibration. So sometimes it's also called tuning, so, but what I mean by calibration and tuning is really this estimation. Okay, and so the, the problem now, um, what I will be concerned with is if you use some data to calibrate your model, can you then use the very same data to confirm your model? That's the problem, and this is in the philosophy literature usually called double counting. Double counting because you use it once for calibration and once for confirmation. And, I mean, of course, as you can immediately see, I mean, this is an issue which is not special for climate science. It arises whenever you, know, you estimate parameters in models. So it's, of course, an issue. Um, other physical theories and economics and biology and so on. But there is really a quite controversial debate in climate science. That's why I'm focusing on climate science here today. So, um, there are very various different positions in climate science. I'll focus on one of, the, of them at, at the very beginning now, which is a very popular position, namely the idea, well, I can't use this very same data for both calibration and confirmation. So I should use separate data for calibration and confirmation. And I've just some quotes here. So the first quote is from the IPCC report, um, where they write, if the model has been tuned to give a good representation of a particular observed quantity, that agreement with that observation cannot be used to build confidence in that model. And so you see here, I mean, here you have tuned, I mean, that's the calibration, the estimation, and the build confidence is the confirmation. So the idea is don't use the same data for both calibration and confirmation. And another quote where you find that position is, it's again from climate scientists, uh, it's the second quote here, um, where they say, um, in addition, some commentators feel that there is an unscientific circularity in some of the arguments provided by general um, circulation modelers. For example, the claim that GCMs may produce a good simulation sits uneasily with the fact that important aspects of the simulation rely upon tuning. So, I mean, here it's more uh, the concern is voiced. So, if the data have been used for tuning or calibration, isn't that, doesn't that that can't be not used the very same thing. Isn't, isn't there something dubious then about using the same data for, for confirmation? 
So that's a popular position, and many of you will probably be quite familiar with that position because it's also a very popular position in philosophy. Um, and in particular, there's this um, sort of quite important idea of the use novel account propounded, uh, for instance, by John Worrell. Um, the basic idea is that use novel is just the idea, and it's in the name, that it's illegitimate to use data for calibration if they have already been used before. So they need to, if you want to use them for calibration, um, they need to be used novel. And I mean, this idea really has a long history. It really also goes back to um, Lakadosh and his investigation of Ptolemaic astronomy versus um, Copernican astronomy, where he very much makes use of, of these ideas. So it's very much an intuitive idea. I mean, this is not a formal account of confirmation, anything like that, but what an intuitive account of what's going on and developed by the and then further developed by John Borrow. Okay. And what I will be arguing here is at least, I mean, this, in this, this position I think is quite intuitive. That's why also many climate scientists um, endorse it at an, intuitive, at an intuitive level. What I will be arguing here that at least in the Bayesian framework of confirmation theory, which is of course a very popular framework and one of the main frameworks um, of confirmation in philosophy, um, you don't get this conclusion. Double counting here is just entirely legitimate and there are no worries really about double counting or use novelty. Okay, um, when this is now still the introduction, what I will do is I will introduce a, a very simple model and we'll use the later this model just to illustrate the, the point. Is that this is a very simple model, of course the climate models are hugely different and hugely more complex. But, and I'll give, give later examples of climate science, just to make sure that what I say about the simple models also carries over to the climate models. But nothing substantially changes, so it's better, of course, to work with a simple model. And this is what we will be doing here. So, I mean, this is really to introduce some terminology in the terminology of base models. So what are base models? Base models are really um, the models where the parameters are not yet specified. So they're still open, they're still a three parameter. Like here, the linear model, so yt equals mt, and here the quadratic model, um, yt equals mt squared. Very simple models, and these are the base models. Um, but the parameters are, as you see here, still left open. It's just m, and you know that m is in a certain range. And the same for m. And the model instances now are where the parameters are not free any longer, but particular values are assigned. They assign parameter values to the free parameters. And they are like, and one for instance is um, just the model instance m, where small m is assigned the value one, so that would be y t equals t, and so on. So that's just the terminology, base models and model instances. And with one point which is um, important then when we move to the more realistic, when I mean, we look at the really studies done in climate science, is that so. It's so difficult to model the climate science that any model can really be can never be really fully correct. So that's just out of reach. That's widely accepted. So you need to allow for what you might call structural error that the model doesn't always exactly fit the data, but just approximately. That's the idea. So that's why I have this slide. So what I did is the models, but what 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 do we want to do now with the models? So what hypothesis do we endorse about the models? And as I mentioned, there are of course several questions which arise here, like. And this is the question about structural error. Are the models supposed to be exact, really? Or um, are they known to be imperfect and do you just want to get it roughly right? And that's structural error and you need in climate science something like that. Um, then of course there is a question about observations, whether they, are, whether they are exact or not. And of course usually they are not exact, that's clear. Um, just, to, just to flag the issue really here that there are these issues arising here and what we will be working in for what follows, I mean, it doesn't really matter, the other cases you get the same conclusion, but here we'll be working just with this idea of structural error. That's on the next slide. So we have our models M and N as before, but now we allow a certain error because, as I said, in climate science, you just say, I just want to get it roughly right, and if I manage to get it roughly right, that's even good. So for this simple model, we can just say, well, let's add an error term and let's just add a Gaussian distribution, a normal distribution with mean zero and, and standard deviation sigma. 
And so this is what we're doing here, and this is the model that we're working for, what follows to illustrate the simple points. And I mean, this really terminology is the same. M is another base model, so M1 now is just and this linear model and where M equals 1 plus the normal distribution, I've certainly ever allowed. Okay, and then the final slide in the introduction, which is to say we've introduced all this framework of um, base models and model instances, and what, so how they can we then re rephrase this question of double counting in this framework. And that's how you rephrase it, which should be fairly clear, but it's still good to have a slide about that. So the idea here is, so if you use data to confirm which model instance is true, so this one, there's a which determine, that's better, which to determine which instance of the model is true, um, can then this very same data also confirm the base hypothesis. So that's the question of double counting in a framework. And it's just, this is what John Borrell and, and, and others are discussing. Okay, so, so that was the introduction really just to introduce the topic and to um, introduce the basic examples we will be working with. And here's the outline. I mean, there are different kinds of confirmation which I will distinguish, maybe comparative confirmation and non-comparative confirmation. I'll start with comparative confirmation just because it's easier. I mean, the points are essentially the same, but it's easier to understand. Then I'll give an example of climate science, where this comparative confirmation, um, where there is comparative confirmation and where uh, basically double counting happens, and I think rightly so. And then there's non-comparative confirmation. And so, as I said in the conclusion, I will be arguing for that at least in the Bayesian framework, double counting is, is just fine. There's no problem about it. This, of course, raises the question, so there is all this debate about calibration, confirmation, and problems with calibration, and problems with confirmation. So what is then the debate about? And so this is the section of deductive problems. What I'll be arguing is this, I mean, I will be arguing there are problems with confirmation and calibration in climate science. And I'll talk about them in this section. But they are just different problems. It's not the problem of double counting, but other problems. And then another case study about comparative confirmation, where you also see these inductive problems at work. So we'll see that here. And then finally, conclusion. OK, so let's start with comparative confirmation. I mean, the term says it, I mean, comparative confirmation is right here. This is really the simpler case where you just say, well, I want to compare hypothesis H1 versus hypothesis H2. I want to know, is H1 doing better than H2? Are they equally good, or is H2 doing better than H1? That's the comparative confirmation. And I should say, of course, I'm working here with, as I said, the Bayesian framework. So, I mean, in the paper, really, what's, what's underlying this talk is really uh, formal results in Bayesian confirmation theory. You can do it formally. I will here um, keep the discussion um, at an intuitive level because I think it's much easier to understand. But if anyone is interested in really some of the more technical details, we can, of course, discuss that later. So, I mean, just to remind you, um, this is, of course, the basic postulate of Bayesian confirmation theory. You say the probability of model evidence. What you do is you go back to probability of evidence given the model and multiply probability model and divide it by the probability of evidence. And as I said, I mean, the, I'll, I'll present the results at an intuitive level, but it, it's really interesting to go into the um, just formal analysis too, because it's actually quite really can tell you. Okay, so probabilistic confirmation theory and now comparative confirmation. Um, Let's just, I mean, this is really now an intuitive presentation of what you do when you do the formal analysis of Bayesian confirmation theory, what you find. This is, you can interpret, you can explain it intuitively too. This is what I've been doing here. So these are 11 data points. So let's just say these are your, your points you get um, once you have observed the system. And so when you now think back about the model M and N, so with these base models M and N, and now what you do is you ask the first thing, so which model instances are, are the most successful ones, are doing best, and that's the calibration step. And um, so let's assume here we find, so we do it first for the linear model, and we get y equals 5t, that this model is doing, model instance is doing best, and we get for n2, and that, you know, small n equals 2, so that's 2t squared, this is the other curve here, that this is the best fit to the given data. 
And I mean, there's a good reason why I have chosen that example because um, you see when you look at it, well, you do the calibration, you estimate the best performing model distance, but then you immediately sort of see here, well, it seems that the linear model is actually just fitting the data better than the quadratic one. And so you see when you do the, once you have, you see actually that you get a better fit for the linear model than for the quadratic model. So with the very same data, even though you have used the data already for, um, for calibration. So this is the step you see, well, intuitively there's a better fit and you can, of course, what, what this means in the base and confirmation theory is that you get something like probability E given N2 is smaller probability E given N5. And when you plug it in in the machinery, you get, well, M is confirmed relative to N. So this, as I said, I mean, the examples where things are not so clear, but intuitive, and that example is quite clear, and I've chosen it for good reason, because this is what you find for the formal analysis. So what you find here, I think very intuitive scientists, of course, doing that too, you find that, well, you're using all these data points for both calibration and confirmation. And you can't show that, I mean, this is not an example, but you can show it just at a very general level with the Bayesian confirmation theory. Namely, you can show, actually, there can be double counting because one model has a better fit with the data than another. And, I mean, here, according to Bayesian confirmation theory, this is entirely fine, there's nothing problematic. And I should also say, I mean, I've chosen here the uncontroversial and very intuitive case, but quite interesting that when you look at Bayesian confirmation theory, you actually find that there are different cases of double counting. So this is the double counted because one model has a bit better fit with the data than another. This is very intuitive, that's why I presented it here. But you actually find, I won't talk about that, but if anyone is interested, we can talk about it later. There are also other cases of double counting. Um, and Bayesian confirmation theory, then, when you investigate it, you can somehow shows you that there are these other cases of double counting, and you can actually then, I think, find them in science too. So, um, it's a quite nice feature. Okay, so now I just want to present, as this was for the simple model, now I just want to present a study where really exactly this is going on. Um, maybe it is really, again, about the arrows of force, so we'll come back to this uh, example I introduced at the beginning. As I said, measures the change in mean temperature resulting from the concentration of aerosols, and it usually leads to cooling. And what they do, Harley and Kaufman, in a uh, climate study is, it's just one of these standard uh, papers in climate science. They use the mean surface temperature changes, so the data, the past data, to estimate the aerosol force in the constraint. And what they're doing, and this is, this is really the setting of um, comparative confirmation, so they compare two base models, and they ask which of these models is just doing better. And the two base models are M, where you just say, well, here the hypothesis is that the data are explained by natural and anthropogenic forces, so it's natural and human influences to the climate, so to speak. The alternative hypothesis is here that it's only um, anthropogenic, so only human influences to the climate. So we want to uh, know which of these hypotheses is better supported by the data. And so what they are doing now is of course not exactly what is what you usually find. This is they are not exactly what Bayesian they don't do exactly what Bayesian confirmation theory would do. But um, you can easily reconstruct it in terms of probabilistic confirmation theory. So what they do is is that they have these three parameters of the aerosol forcing and they now um, just the first step, what they're doing is they run through all the different values of this possible um, aerosol force thing and have a look how this model instances fit um, to the data. And what they really find is that, so they start with you know, M1, M2 and so on and just have a look whether these model instances fit to the data and the same for M1, M2 and so on. And what they find is that N is just not doing well at all. So none of the model instances here, I mean, there are some which are doing better than others, of course, but none really fit the data well at all. So in short, as I write here, you get that all models except a subset of the family M are effectively disconfirmed by the evidence. You just find that the model class M doesn't really fit to the data at all very well. And in M it's different. You find that there are model instances that explain the data very well. So, 
And then, of course, what you do is there are certain instances of M that explain the data well and certain that don't. And so, of course, you, you're just interested in those that explain the data well, and from those you estimate your error for a forcing range. And in that case, um, they arrive at this range of minus 1.5, 0. So, that is just a very, it's really just like the example before. Here you have double count, and you're just using the data to confirm M relative to N. So, the idea that actually we need both natural and untrue prosthetic forcings to explain the data. Um, just human influences are not enough. And, uh, but at the very same time, you also then use the very same data to estimate your error result for Okay, this is just one of the examples where I think double counting just is naturally done and nothing is conceived to be problematic here, um, at least not in that case study, I think. Okay, now to um, non comparative confirmation, I've said I'll, I'll start with comparative confirmation because it's just much easier, of course, to compare two hypotheses. Um, but what policy makers are, of course, interested in usually is not non-comparative confirmation, but really where their model is confirmed per se. So they're not so much interested whether H1 is doing better than H2, because both might actually not be doing very well. But they want to know, is H1 doing well? And so that's the non-comparative uh, confirmation. And I mean, formally in Bayesian confirmation theory, you just what you do is compare m relative to, to the complement of m. And but intuitively, really just that it is m confirmed. And I mean, just to say you can run the analysis, it's really just exactly the same as for um, comparative confirmation. You find exactly the same kinds, different kinds of double counting, and um, they are non problematic from the Bayesian perspective. And um, here worries about double counting from a Bayesian perspective are, are misplaced. Okay, so as I said, I'm at least from Bayesian confirmation theory, this intuitive, this quote at the beginning where there, there are worries about double counting are um, not justified. There's nothing problematic about double counting. And as I said, I mean, this raises, of course, the question. So there's all this discussion about problems of calibration, problems of confirmation in climate science. And if now double counting is not a problem, what are the problems about? This inductive problem section is about this. And I'll present here three um, major problems, and especially the first two, I think, are really problems which some climate scientists take very seriously. The third one I'll come to that is interesting also for philosophical reasons. But the first two ones are definitely problems which climate scientists raise, but I'll argue there that just different from double counting, they're different problems. So, really basically what I, what I said, just they're different problems, they're of course important problems about confirmation and calibration, but they're not about double counting. They're really more problems about questioning whether the inductive reasoning as a right here fails. Okay, then let me come to the first problem. So, this is one problem really made best to think in terms of the relevance of the evidence and in terms of the lifespan of the model. So the intuitive idea here is, well, if you ever want to make predictions about 2100, that's of course what I call the medium run future, that's quite a, a, a bit in the future. It's not the next 10 years, but quite a bit in the future. And so if the lifespan of the models are very, very short, um, and the evidence we have about, about the present climate and the past climate, the simple evidence is relevant to such a model about the future, because the lifespan of these models is short. And that's one worry that I think climate scientists definitely, some climate scientists at least have. Um, the underlying thought here, and to motivate it a bit more, is that over longer time spans, of course, um, certain processes which are not very well understood, for instance, about ice sheets and so on, uh, play a role. So over shorter time periods, it might, this might, I mean, given that you know what the ice is now and so on, you might say, well, I can make new predictions in the next 10 years or so, but it's much, much more difficult to, to know what's happening with this process on a longer time scale. And that's the, the underlying thought where this worry comes from. So the idea that, so if we have climate models um, they actually have this very, very short time, um, this very short lifespan. And I mean, I have a quote here, which illustrates this position. 
So from staying for the now, um, where they write, so statements about future climate relate to never before experienced state of the system. Thus, it's impossible to either calibrate the model for the forecaster's regime of interest or confirm the usefulness of the forecasting process. So the idea here is, you see that these are problems, I mean, this problem definitely concerns calibration and confirmation, but it really uh, is the problem that if the data are not relevant, and of course we can't use it for calibration and we can't use it for confirmation. It's like, of course, um, if you have a phenomenon about uh, maybe temperature and then you have data about participation, it's clear that you can't use the participation data to make any inference about um, the temperature. And similarly here, you say this data really is about something different. And so, um, past data just can't be used for calibration confirmation. And that's certainly a worry um, which climate scientists have. But I mean, that, that's immediately clear. This issue is really about something different. It's about the failure of confirmation, the failure of about calibration. It fails because you don't have relevant data, but it has nothing to do with that accounting. OK, um, another problem on which some climate scientists voice, I think, is Again, more about future predictions. So, when, as I said, um, we certainly know enough about the climate system to say that we, we, there is a problem and that climate change um, is happening to some extent. And um, but it's still quite difficult to come up with good predictions. And as I said, there are lots of processes which are, of course, not very well understood. And so, when you want to make predictions now with models you actually face a lot of uncertainty about this, what I call not the complement of M. So you have a model M, and then, the, then you have this complement of our other possible models. And you always face, of course, some un uncertainty about the other possible models. But in the climate community, like this uncertainty is even uh, stronger because the processes are so, so purely under understood. So you know very little about these other models, this complement of M. And so the conclusion here is that we are unable to assess even roughly how likely the evidence is given these other possible models. And so there is no confirmation. So what, I mean, what would, so we'll probably first give um, the quote to uh, motivate that problem again. So here another quote, climate scientists, where they say, we take climate ensemble and exploring model uncertainty as potentially providing a lower bound on the maximum range of uncertainty, and thus a non-discountable, um, for which they mean unable to ignore the climate change envelope, for which they mean range of climate change predictions. So what's expressed, I think, in the quote really is, and when you talk with the climate scientists, this is what they have in mind, is that so that the, the projections we make are actually quite important. They are possibilities. We should take them seriously. But it's not, they are really just possibilities. They are not confirmed in any strong sense. Uh, it's really just possibilities. And so uh, this is this problem of radical uncertainty about the complement. And you always have some uncertainty about the complement, of course. You never really know for sure what are your other models that could explain the data. But um, this issue is compounded here, as I said, by not understanding the relevant processes very well. And, and that is an important problem. There's no question about that. And it has an analog in Bayesian confirmation theory because when you, what you find, of course, if you can't say much about your complement of M, your basic machinery breaks down, you can't calculate the probabilities anymore. And so what you get is you just don't know whether it is confirmation or not. It really corresponds to what's intuitively going on here. And I mean, again, important, of course, it's a problem about confirmation, um, but it's has nothing to do with the legitimacy of double counting. And as I said, I mean, these two problems are, I think, particularly important for some climate scientists and their voice these concerns. But the third problem is, um, I think, also discussed by climate scientists, but also quite important um, given this idea of use novelty and, and John Rawl and say more about that. So, I mean, that's a very simple problem. I mean, this is, everyone have, has already thought about it, I'm sure. This idea, so if you have a model and whatever the data, your model can just explain the data well, can provide a good fit with the model, then you think, well, that's, that's cheap, you know, that doesn't confirm the model. And just to provide uh, one of the obvious examples, of course, you have something like polynomial with 100 parameters, 
you have 100 data, and, and this will always work. So your, your model will always be able to explain the data. That's not a problem. And so in these cases, we have an intuitive judgment that many scientists, of course, have is that both M and not M are doing equally well. I mean, there is no confirmation. So in this case, you calibrate. You can estimate the parameters, of course. But it's cheap, there is no way to falsify the model, so there is no confirmation. And we think this plays some role in the climate context, um, but it's particularly important, and I think, when you really compare this use novelty idea, also, um, as I said, propounded by Lakadosh Rohr and so on, with the Bayesian framework. So, this use, I think, proponents of the use novelty approach, they really, they, they usually look at such examples. I mean, yeah, Polydoma is, of course, a very um, a simple example, but you can also look at case studies in science, um, creationism, and other, uh, of course, the epicycle theory and so on, where you encounter a similar situation. And the, the conclusions, the use novelists draw from that, from examples of this kind, is that there's something wrong with other company. But, I mean, the Bayesian analysis also looks at the examples and um, would, would arrive at very different conclusions. They would say, well, this, this is not a problem with other company. It's really just that there is no confirmation here. You, know, you do the machinery, you find that there's calibration, but there's no confirmation. So the conclusions drawn from these examples are quite different in the two frameworks, I think. And that's why, I mean, presenting this problem, I think, is important. Okay, and I mean, just to say, these, these three inductive problems are, of course, um, interesting problems in the sense that they um, just analysis of the failures of induction of course, a core philosophical topic. and um, you also find, I think, again, I mean, these problems are not really, they arise maybe in a particular strong way in climate science, but especially this first problem about the relevance of past, I mean, the relevance of past data to making future predictions very much also arises with, uh, in some areas in, econ in, econ in, in economics, so I have discussion with some um, economists where they say they really very much encounter similar problems. They thought it's a very good model, and it is a very good model in the regime. But then they didn't know that, you know, when once it gets to the future, the underlying assumption change, and so the past data aren't really relevant anymore. So these problems are to some extent transferable, I think, to other um, sciences too. And let me now just give, an, as a final example, really, an example about non-comparative confirmation, where we will see again double counting at work, and then also really see these three inductive problems. Um, so this is Nutia et al. in 2003, um, also based on a nature study. And what they do is, again, they have also a full set. I have mean, chosen that example for a reason. You again have, let's recall, the aerosol forcing really measures, um, simply put, the extent of the cooling of the earth, of the aerosols. And you want to estimate it from the data. And the issue here is a comparative confirmation. You want to know whether M is doing well. And what they do actually, and this is just a side remark, is quite close to what the Bayesian framework is doing. They even work with initial uniform probabilities over, I mean, this they say is the a priori plausible range of the aerosol forces that expect it to be somewhere between minus two and zero. And uh, start with a uniform probability distribution. And then they have, I mean, here's where the structural error comes in. And they say that um, a model instance is doing well by which they mean is consistent with the data if the average difference between the observations, so the real observations and the simulated observations is smaller than a constant, and of course the smaller the difference, the better. So um, I think this is really just to give you, and um, this is a constant, let's look at the um, picture first. So this is a consistent model instance. I mean, ignore the dashed line, just look at the solid line. This is a really just your model has certain three parameters, including the aerosol force, and you assign a certain specific value to it, and you run it, and this is the, the line, the curtain bit. So it's the model instance. And the gray shaded area is really the observations plus error. So this is, you want your um, model instances to be in the gray shaded area. And you see, it's not perfect. So here, for instance, it doesn't match it quite okay. But it's still consistent because we just have, we have this idea it should be roughly able to reduce the data, so the structural model error here. And 
So what they do is, again, I mean, they look at all the different po possible model, uh, sorry, parameter values, and run, uh, calculate this model instance, and then look which ones are doing good, and which ones are doing not so, uh, which ones are doing well, so and which ones are doing not so well. And from that, they can actually constrain the aerosol range. So we call them, and this is the range they started with, and then they, when they do these calculations, they find, well, this range at the very um, bottom, we can exclude that. It should be, it's quite likely that it's, it is between minus 1.2 and zero. So they do this calibration, estimation of the parameter values, but then at the very same time, they, so at least in that paper, they don't say much about it, but the CMO to endorse the position that the very same model is also confirmed by the data. I mean, they say one, they have one comment where they say something like, actually, it's non trivial that the model manages to produce the data. So the model could have actually been failed to simulate the data at all. So there is a certain kind of confirmation. This seems to be what's going on. I mean, they don't say much about that, I mean, which is goes often the case. But they do think they do seem to think that there's confirmation here too, and it's the very same data. So um, and now really the inductive problem is coming. I mean, this, this is a case of double counting, and in principle quite fine and not a problem. But of course you can question that story, but not by questioning double counting. You could actually say there are other problems at work here. And some, I think, climate science would, would definitely say that. They would say, I mean, these are really the first two problems, which is then mainly relevant. So yeah. others would say, as I said, that there is no confirmation um, because well, I mean, these are really the concern of this model is really the future predictions. And for the future predictions, you know, the evidence we are having, the lifespan of the model is short. Um, it just doesn't work. It seems to work, but once you really analyze it at a deeper level, it doesn't. And also the second problem that you say, well, you know, this is just one model. The model doesn't really represent the process, the processes, the relevant, relevant processes very well, and these relevant processes aren't really very well understood. So we can't just say it's a possibility, but it's not confirmed in any sense. This is the, the second problem. I mean, the third problem doesn't really arise here because, as I said, this is the third problem is about um, the data not force, not being able to falsify the model. But that's actually possible. Here. So the third problem doesn't arise here. So, and you can voice this concern, and I think it's fine to voice these concerns, of course. But it's not about that accounting, but about something else. And I mean, here there's certainly a topic where, you know, there are some climate scientists that would say, well, there's confirmation here, unproblematic, and some they would say, well, let's be a bit more cautious. There is actually a problem here about confirmation because of these two problems. Okay, and then really the conclusion um, is that there is this, this intuitive idea, and it's certainly very intuitive, there's something wrong about using data for the very same data for confirmation and calibration. Um, but at least according to the space and confirmation theory framework, there's nothing wrong about it. And double counting is legitimate, and I've presented an intuitive example which um, explains the more formal results. And then said, well, of course, there's a big debate about confirmation calibration in climate science. But they said, these are really about other issues, like really that confirmation and double counting might fail because of this irrelevancy of past data for assessing the medium run future models. It's really a more radical uncertainty about the other possible models and the third idea that models provide a good fit with any arbitrary data and we can't falsify them. Okay, and then just finally if someone is interested in looking at the paper, I should say that I mean, this talk as well as the paper's joint work with my colleague Katie Steele and here you can read more about the formal results and also about the monetary governments. Thank you very much. you here, Wayne, and then Stathis. Um, thank you for this. Um, can we just suggest something about what people might mean when they come to think of the, um, double counting as a concern, and I guess maybe it is a legitimate concern. It has to do with that third problem that you mentioned of, about overfitting. Mm -hmm. And as you know, there's a lot of um, literature on you know, statistical model choice. And you know, everyone knows that if you've got a bunch of models to choose from, um, the one you're going to use, you don't just automatically go with the one that fits the data best because it might be overfitting. Right? Um, 
In one way, you know, there's you know, all these techniques out there to guard against overfitting or try to estimate tell when it's happening. And you know, the simplest to, to do, way to do it is to just divide your data into two clumps, tune it on one clump, and then test it on the other. And I wonder if, with, in those initial quotes, um, that's actually what people mean when they say we should be um, um, double counting. That, 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 we, that we should be, you know, we, uh, uh, we, we should be guarding against overfitting by using a technique, something like that. Yes, no, I mean, it, it really very much fits to the work we are doing now. So let me just say something. I mean, this is really where, absolutely, so there is this concern about overfitting. Mm -hmm. The, prop, the point is just so, that's why the confirmation theory framework is important. So from the Bayesian perspective, the overfitting problem is not a problem about, about double counting. It's, about, it's a problem, I mean, this is really relates to, let me probably go back to the slide here. Maybe this is best to explain it. So if you look at examples like that, that problem, there is a, the problem of overfitting in the Bayesian framework is not a problem about using of data or about double counting. But really about, you can have, you know, you can of course make a probabilistic analysis of, you, know, you say, models that have uh, five free parameters versus one, models that have one free parameter, and whether the one free parameter model is doing better than the five free parameter. But the analysis from the Bayesian framework is always that this is something to do with the probabilities. And it doesn't, I mean, the, uh, maybe it's also to um, diagnose what's going on here. For the Bayesian framework, the problem is never double count. And it doesn't help anything to split up the data like that. But let me just continue. Yeah. I, I, just to say something because it's important. This leads to work we are doing now. Because if you do, if you move from the Bayesian confirmation theory framework to a different framework, and I think this is a framework you probably are maybe a bit alluding to with your dividing the data up into pieces. So that's that's a common procedure, what's usually called cross validation. You know, you do all kinds of com uh, combinations, not only one combination, but different combinations. And then you are, you are adopting really a different framework of confirmation. So model selection theory is simply a different framework of confirmation compared to Bayesianism. And once you look at model selection theory, um, I mean, this is the work we're doing now, I call it KT Steel and I. So you, the problem here, um, the analysis of the problem is to some extent similar and to some extent different. You actually find, I mean, just to quickly summarize it, because otherwise I talk too much, but we can talk about it later. So in model selection theory, you also find that double counting is fine, and you actually do double count, but use nobody still plays a role, which you see in this uh, cross-validation procedure. It actually has a role to play that the, the data here are usable. But what you're finding in model selection theory, just to final remark I make about that, is either this case we do something like cross-validation, or you do you really have a case where the use novelty, novel data are not required, but then you get some kind of penalty for confirmation, just to say that. But it's still quite, even if you look at model, the, uh, model selection theory, it's still quite different, interestingly, from the Lakadosh and Vora conclusions, in the sense that double counting is entirely fine. Double counting is okay. I just want to ask a footnote really quick. Because um, you said that when you, you move from Bayesian confirmation to model choice, you're moving into to a completely different framework. And I don't think that's right. And the reason I don't think that right is that, you know, as a Bayesian, you know, there's Bayesian confirmation and there's Bayesian decision theory. And the, the Bayesian, the way Bayesian thinks about model choice is as an expected utility calculation. Which of these models, I've got all these models, I've got, you know, here's how well they do on the, the data. I want to choose, make a choice about which one I'm going to use to, you know, for my projections. And if you think of it that way, that you know the naive rule pick the model that fits the data best is a lousy rule because you you know because you know because the overfitting problem is going to have um, poor expected fit to future data and you know, so you want you know so that, that's how Bayesian would think about this you know you, you want to get a, a good model selection rule you know as an expected utility thing and there you know the you know cross validation rule would be a better one and, and, and Bayesian could acknowledge that. I think what you would have to discuss more. I do think that the frameworks are anyway a bit different. You know, I do think that they provide different frameworks about evidence. I mean, the model selection theory is really basic, very much based on classical statistics and repeated, you know, trials and so on. And you don't have that so much in that Bayesian framework. But we would have to discuss it. But I do think of them as quite. I, I do think that they're different frameworks of evidence. Okay, Stavros is next.
I, I couldn't see what the structure of the philosophical argument if there was any was in the field at all. The way we reconstruct the argument is that some climate scientists think double counting would be okay, therefore double counting would be okay. And I, I couldn't see any philosophical argument. For instance, the Bayesian argument, you say, makes the whole point of the comparative confirmation, makes the evidence calibration versus confirmation irrelevant simply because the evidence probably the evidence drops out of the, of the comparison. So it doesn't matter whether you calibrate, you consult a soothsayer, you collect data, you do trials. All it matters is that it's got different trials and different maybe likelihoods. So that's a good example of why calibration confirmation does not, does not count. What is the problem really, it seems to me, and it's a philosophical discussion which was totally absent about the, 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 the idea of you know, what Wayne said ultimately, and the point you want to dismiss, slide you've got now there, whether you can actually, looking for novel predictions or novel data, is extra way to confirmation, precisely because it avoids problems like overfitting, or cooking up, or making the, the data fit the theory by forcing the theory. And the argument that this calibration of no confirmation is neither here nor there, simply because some people think it's confirmation, and there is a whole school, historical school of confirmation and things like that. So I couldn't see anything like, like an argument in this. You know, the argument, I mean, let me just try to explain again, you know, the argument, I mean, a philosophical argument is definitely, you say, I mean, you, of course, talk with this, with my colleague also about, um, discuss this, this work, of course, also with John Rawls. It's definitely a philosophical argument in the sense that, so, when we discuss this work with John Rawls, for instance, so he has very strong in this idea that use number to play a role, but when you look at the base analysis, this is not what's going on. I mean, um, insofar as you think that this idea of use novelty um, is a philosophical problem, and I think it is in the sense that you ask, ah, does it count anything that data have already been used before or not? Is this relevant or not? I take this to be at least a methodological problem. And insofar as this is a problem, I mean, there is this use novelty position and there are these other positions. Um, and you know, for the Bayesian, this use novelty isn't really relevant at all. And I think that, that is interesting philosophically. This is a conceptual but problem. That's not quite right. That's not quite right. I'm sorry. I mean, there is a whole debate about old evidence. The old evidence is by, is novel, novel evidence by another name. And there are serious Bayesian approaches to show how you can actually rely on known evidence to confirm. And, and, and so, so, so Bayesians are sensitive to the problem, and they disagree on how they solve it. So it's not as if the problem does not arise within the Bayesian framework. It arises by a different name. And, and, and other than that, I think, I mean, there, there is this at least conceptual problem, certainly, that, uh, that mm -hmm. this conceptual question, what's expressed as any quotes by climate scientists, whether actually are we allowed to use the same data for confirmation and calibration or not? And of course, there are some positions that say yes, and that some that, that say no. And this is just to say, according to the Bayesian bar framework, the question is, um, that the answer is, that's not a problem whatsoever. And you actually can also explain it in that framework for what reasons uh, this is a problem, uh, is not a problem. And yeah, I think that, that, that is interesting, and that is a philosophical debate too. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm going to interject myself, take advantage sure. of the position's chair. I see that there's another question. but. Let me ask two questions. Uh, so the first is a, a minor one about the first of the inductive problems that you disentangled. So it seemed to me that there are two things going on in relation to the relevance of evidence. One was that you might have processes that are occurring on dynamical scales that are longer than whatever it is that you're modeling so that they wouldn't show up in some way. But the quote you had seemed to indicate a different problem, which is that the system might be in a state that it's never been in or something like that in 2100 and so that you're not sure that the calibrated parameters you have in your model are relevant. So it seems like those are actually two sort of different issues. So, okay. yeah, a never before experienced data the system. So that seems different than the, the thing you mentioned, which is about the time scale. So that's a, a, a minor point, just okay. saying that there might yeah. be. I see. I think, I mean, you know, I know these climate scientists quite well and I've discussed it. So what they have in mind, I think, is quite what. what uh, so maybe that, that quote is to some extent ambiguous, and that, that's mm -hmm. a good point. I think what they have in mind here is this really the relevancy of the, uh, the, the relevancy of what I've said, that the past dates are just out relevant to, it's not that something different with these parameters, not the first problem, but it's really that, so if we have data from uh, closer to, to 2100, that's a good be a problem. 
that it's Sorry. really just that we don't have. But I think I, I've seen it, so it's in a way ambiguous what, what they have. Right. Yeah. The, the yeah. other question was, I think, related to Wayne's question, in the sense it seems that in the move from comparative questions to non-comparative questions, there's a way in which you can see a big change happening, which in your talk you said fairly quickly the Bayesian analysis applies to the non-comparative case. But if you start off with just two base models and you're asking, uh, once you've calibrated the parameters, and I think your argument was that the assessment of confirmation then depends upon the likelihoods for the model instances that are the best fit for that set of data. And so you can try to calculate the likelihoods in that case. When you shift, shift to the non-comparative case, where you're just calculating the likelihood for the negation of the model, that does seem like a quite different question. And I, I take it your position is that the use novelty uh, arguments, so the sort of thing that Staffus was referring to, they think that there is an issue of confirmation there, whereas you're willing to just say, these are cases where you have no conclusion of confirmatory success. Because you can't do the kind of calculation that you can do in the case where you have a specific list of base models? I mean, I would say, you know, of course, mm -hmm. it's quite much more difficult to talk about non-comparative confirmation. Mm -hmm. Because comparative is easy, you have the models, you can estimate the probabilities, roughly everything is. And um, the reason why I said that nothing substantially changes is, so if you talk to proponents of the use novel, account like John Rawls and so on, they, they would even say that already in the in the um, non -com at, at the comparative confirmation, so they would even already doubt what's going on there, I think. Mm -hmm. So so uh, you can look at what's going on. I think there are further problems for the non-comparative confirmation um, in the sense that it's much harder, of course, to confirm the, mm -hmm. in a non-comparative way that comes out in the basic framework very much. But the basic point you already see at the so this basic dispute you already see at the um, comparative level and mm -hmm. really just carries over with the non-comparative level. I would say there are further problems, yes, but um, the problem of double counting arises in both scenarios. And I mean, it, this really... Sorry, I'm, I'm it, listening, but I'm sure, gonna, yeah. the, this really, I mean, this really relates to the second inductive problem, what I said. So if, so the analysis that things of the, the comparative confirmation carries over to the non-comparative confirmation very much hinges on that you're somehow able to deal with this complement of M. Mm -hmm. If you're of course not able to deal with it and you don't know anymore what to say at all about it, can't even give rough estimates, then you are more in this situation of inductive problem one, uh, problem two, and then you encounter further problems. Yeah. Great, so in the back. Uh, yeah, I've worked with the model factors for years on from physics, I provide data. Uh, we have a different interpretation of what double counting amounts to. To me, in your very first slide, where you had the linear point with 11 mm. points, double counting, it's fine to put as many models as you like to those 11 points. What you need to then do is go and make another 11 measurements, totally different measurements. And then the question arises, so I fit my new model with that new measurements. If I take the new measurements and the old measurements and combine them together to do my bit, that is double counting. That's a different thing. You know, I can put as many models as I like to the first 11 points. Double counting is when I start using the data that I use to develop the model to do the fitting. And scientists do it both ways, of course. They do. So I think we seem to have a misinterpretation of what double counting is. You know, I think I mean, the, 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 the answer to that is, of course, I mean, what double counting is, it's a bit of a terminological issue here, too. You know, there are a lot of, I mean, I, I've used this double counting, I think, as it's usually understood in that. In the, they may, to some extent, I think they may understand it in philosophy, is to say it is use novelty account and this is how it's discussed. And of course, I mean, you do actually find that in climate science some, some people are calling something else of accounting. And that's not a problem as long as we know what we are talking about. Um, that's the first point to, to be made. I mean, this is to some extent also a terminology choice motivated by debates in philosophy. The second is really, I mean, I think this feeds back also to some extent to, to Wayne's question. Um, and really to, to these different confirmatory frameworks. I think if you, if you so these, these things of splitting up the data, so in, in a Bayesian analysis, this just doesn't help. That's not a, that, 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 that's for, for the Bayesians, I mean, these things, you, you don't do them. This, um, uh, this, this is, is in, in, this, in this theory, it can't make sense of this playing any different role. So if you go to something like model selection theory, and um, there are these differences, and these practices um, can be made sense of. But in the Bayesian framework, I think it's just, 
and level pounding, and you should use all the data to you know, constrain your um, model instances, and then, and then to update, to do the standard updating, and to update your, your, your probabilities in that way. So it really comes down to this being one framework and the other one being another framework. I'll just make one other quick comment. I've been working with models for 30 years, mm. and I'm this, it's a repeated cycle. The modelers are convinced their results are right. And then experimentalists show, no, that didn't work. So then the modelers have to invent something new. So, for example, we have a period in the 60s and 70s when radio drag is the main mechanism of radio drag. Then people realize gravity waves existed, that means we have a bidirectional forcing which no longer means radio drag. This goes on and on and on, and it's still happening today. And one of the big problems, unfortunately, with this sort of argument is you should lock yourself in a room and say, I've got everything available to me. The most important thing that's missing is, and which unfortunately sort of ideas lead lends to the governments like to hear, is that we don't need more data. That data is we've got we've proven we've proven it exists, all we need to do is worry about computer models. It's a lot cheaper to run a computer program than just have a proper unified study network. And global warming is suffering hugely because of that sort of attitude and the need for more, more data is massive. And as far as predicting into the future, People do more than that. I mean, they will take their model and they say, let's assume we only know the data up to 1970. Does that model match what we observe for the next 30 years? So I think you give, maybe you haven't given scientists completely fair uh, treatment here because we do backtrack. We do this all the time. Um, but the main thing I think the most important thing is observation is absolutely key and this sort of running around in circles inside a model doesn't solve the problem. I mean, I think what, what you're saying, that's, that, that, that's that's obviously a, a different problem to the problem of double count, and it's a legitimate problem. And in the sense of, you know, I, what I have done is analyzed. Um, I haven't uh, said that I'm com giving a complete picture of all the different problems of confirmation and calibration. Of course not. And what I've done here is analyze the double counting from the Bayesian framework, and then given um, three problems, I think, which relate to the problems and are sometimes confused with the problems. Um, but it's not, not exhaustive in the sense that I'm claiming these are all the problems. There are the problems too, certainly. Uh, it's on. It's on, yeah. okay. I'm only a physicist, so I wouldn't know how to start this thing. Uh, I'm Gordon McVeigh, I am a physicist, although I don't do that anymore very much. Um, I just want to follow a bit from what Wayne Hawking just said is, I mean, first of all, this question of never you know, we're, we're looking at the future from, and we've never experienced that. I mean, in most kind of modelers go back in time and start, I don't know whether they start, and in fact, some of them go back millions of years. Can we re-stimulate the, the ice age, for example, and the whole variations of things then? And I guess I find it a bit strange to say we're trying to relate to something that's never before experienced and possible to calibrate all this stuff. When, there has been a huge effort in the climate modeling, and I'm not a very part of it, but from what I've seen and talked to people in terms of going back in time and then moving forward. Uh, so I guess one point I think is that it's, and we are looking at states that have it. I mean, what's going to happen in 2100 is not dissimilar to what happened in, say, yeah, I mean, the height of the I mean, last pre- This know, is one opinion of climate scientists to know them quite well, so you would just disagree with what these climate scientists well, I think. Agree with them. I've never heard yeah. of them, but that's okay. They're um, yeah, from the London School of Economics, yeah. Okay. And in the UK, they're one of the... Well, I, you said the London School scientists. of Economics. And I guess my other point is that I think it's inappropriate to lump in the same jargon. I don't I think I don't understand most of what you're talking about because I'm not a philosopher mm -hmm. person in the jargon uh, or sort of the terminology. But, you know, economics is, you know, they do all kinds of modeling, but based on let's say, when no one really knows, in theory, the relationships, whereas in a climate model is based on Newton's laws, laws of, I mean, even with aerosols, we know the radiative forcing field, we know how the dust particle intersects. So there is a, a set of physical criteria which exist in climate modeling that don't exist in, say, economics modeling. No, I think it is a little bit. Yeah. So, okay. I just said that some of this, of course, some of these estimation problems carry over to other disciplines. But of course, I, mean, I would I would not agree with the statement that 
climate scientists and economics are uh, scientifically on par in terms of the model, I would not. I mean, we have lots of physical understanding in climate science, which you sometimes don't have in economics. I would definitely agree with. with respect to that quote, then it's, I think, as I said, I mean, of course, nuclear and our group would also agree with that quote. I mean, this is really a disagreement about some of the climate scientists in the community. Well, I guess I'm perhaps, and just to show my sensitivity to it, when you hear your kind of presentation in the context of debate, and I was in Ottawa meeting with members of Parliament last Thursday, mm -hmm. they would love to hear what you say, because they'll say, based on what you just presented, you throw all the climate stuff, and won't do anything on it. Sorry. And I don't think that's right, and I, I mean, that's the I same one. I know that's not what you're right, no, that's not what you that's said. Right, mm -hmm. but I that's think an interpretation of this. Uh, you know, I think, that, let me just say, I think that's because that's important. I mean, I think that's that's the same with, I mean, those climate sciences like Lenny Smith or Stainforth et al. Um, they raised it very, very explicitly about certain models which are about future predictions. They would certainly not say, so for them it's just very different whether you think you have a model about, so they have no doubts, I think, whatsoever about anything like that that climate change is happening or that we can, that we have good reasons for believing that climate change is happening and they're not in no way. And these climate scientists, they're just important because they, they do have to defend them in that respect. They are no way climate skeptics. To policy makers, they would in no way suggest that there is nothing we should do. They would just also suggest that there's a difference about, you know, the understanding of, of periods where we have good data and where we can make attribution and detection studies. And we have a period of about 2100 where we actually don't know what exactly will happen. They think just there's a real divide between those two situations. But in no way would this mean that they would say to, I don't think they would say to politicians probably anything else than you would say. I don't think so. They would also say, please, they're actually quite concerned about what's happening. They just don't want to commit the fallacy of believing too much about models if it's, if it's too uncertain. But they're, they're in no way climate skeptic and in no way people that would say, uh, don't do anything about climate change. In contrast, they're actually quite concerned about that. Can I just come back? I mean, I wanted to come back and make sure I understood the, the logic of the argument, which is, I think your main focus was trying to disentangle different kinds of worries yes. about the use of evidence. Yeah, exactly. And there's worries that people voice about double counting, although as we've seen, at this point, look, it's just leaving but the, what you mean by double counting is subtle, and perhaps scientists have different mm -hmm. usages in mind. But to, from the Bayesian point of view, you actually don't see there as being a deep problem there. But then there are these other inductive problems that you think are more threatening or often confused. Okay. Yeah, that's basically yeah. that. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, let's actually, thank you. Oh, sorry. Just, you know, thank you for looking at this. Um, it is a part you know came up in Chris's question, but actually, what what do they mean by there by never experienced state of system? Do they mean that um, you know the greenhouse gases are going to be higher you know in 2100 than they ever been, or that we're releasing them more rapidly than natural processes do? What, so what's the context of that never well, before experience? Yeah, I, you know, I mean that's quite. I mean, never experienced system to some extent. You can't say it always about when you make predictions. So there's also trivial things in which this is. You have to ask what they mean. What, what they mean more. is really that that mm -hmm. they what they they worry they have in mind here. I mean, I, of course, I know that I've discussed that with them. So what they mean is, my never experienced mm -hmm. system is that the system that they actually don't they don't understand these more long range processes which might influence the system and. Uh, that the main processes relevant for the past and medium run future are not really included. And so um, that's what they mean by never experienced before it comes to the system. I know that this is ambiguous and it's what we've discussed that at all, but this is really what they mean, that's why I have that here. That, they, that, that actually some of the like, same thing about ice, which is just an example that if the, you, you don't include at certain models, at least, you don't include the Dukes, then you should, and you don't know enough about it. And so, once it's 2100, you, um, the system is really a different one than what your model is modeling now. And that's what they mean by never before an experience. Okay, if there are no further questions, then let's uh, thank Charlotte.